Tonight on Politicat, meet the president. We talk to the newly elected Associated Student Government President and Vice President, Rosalie Gambra, and Nahara Kamalakotla. We're engaged. We discuss recent escalations in Syria and breaking the filibuster. Neil Gorsuch takes his spot on the Supreme Court after a nuclear confrontation. Plus, we'll have an exclusive interview with former Obama speechwriter Cody Keenan. All that and more on Politicat. It's your politics right now. Good evening and welcome to Politicat. I'm Andrew Merica. On tonight's show, we'll talk with newly elected ASG President and Vice President Nahara Kamalakutla and Rosalie Gambra. And later, we'll talk politics with NU College Democrats Co-President Alex Newman and College Republican Secretary of Press Relations Sammy Quattle. But first, today's headlines. Alabama Governor Robert Bentley resigned on Monday after pleading guilty to misdemeanor charges that he used the privileges of his office to carry out and cover up an extramarital affair. Bentley, a conservative who ran on a platform which championed family values and fought the legislation, the, um, the legalization of same-sex marriage, was replaced by former Lieutenant Governor Kay Ivey, the first Republican woman to serve as Alabama's governor. North Korean, North Korean state media issued a warning today that it was prepared to use nuclear force at any sign of American aggression. This comes, as a naval, uh, this comes as a naval force, described by President Trump as an, quote, armada, makes its way toward the Korean peninsula. Trump allegedly talked to China's Xi Jinping about the escalating tensions in North Korea during their summit at Mar-a-Lago last week. Democrats are calling for the resignation or firing of Trump Press Secretary Sean Spicer over comments he made today during a daily press briefing. Spicer compared Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to Adolf Hitler, saying that, quote, Hitler didn't even sink to using chemical weapons, unquote, forgetting the use of gas chambers to kill prisoners in Nazi concentration camps and the Nazi invention of sarin gas, which was used by Assad to kill over 70 people on Tuesday. Spicer later clarified his remarks by saying that Hitler was, quote, not using the gas on his own people the same way. Alderman Mark Tendum finally conceded his run for Evanston's mayor to Steve Haggerty on Monday after a remarkably close election last Tuesday. Haggerty came out ahead by less than 1%, winning 50.36% of the vote to Haggerty's 49.64. The mayor-elect and other local aldermen will be sworn in on May 8th. And now to talk about a different kind of election, we're joined by Northwestern's new Associated Student Government President and Vice President, Nahara Kamalakala and Rosalie Gambra. Neha and Rose, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thank you for having us. So first off, congrats on winning the election. You'll be officially sworn in tomorrow evening, so you're just president-elect and vice president-elect for now. But first, let's talk about a letter that you sent out to media last night. The letter was to Pat Patricia Teus Irvin. She's the vice president of student affairs here at Northwestern, and it has more than 250 student signatures. It reads, in part, we must work together to end our campus's sexual assault epidemic. We students know that the 65 cases that were filed under the Title IX against students in the 2015-2016 academic year, only eight of which resulted in suspension or expulsion or exclusion of a student, are a mere fraction of the actual number of incidents on this campus. Most survivors don't want to begin the reporting process with a hostile and dismissive administration on a campus that has demonstrated time and time again that it does not care about them. The Title IX process must support survivors during reporting and cannot continue to be a source of trauma for victims. Preventing future assaults will require a major culture shift on campus. So tell me a little bit about that culture shift process. Is that going to be a shift in the culture of the students or of the administration? So really the way that we see it is that culture is created by faculty, by administrators, and by the students on this campus. Um, and it starts with the way that we all work together to address this issue. First, uh, with the administration admitting that there is an issue, that there is a problem here and it needs to be addressed. Um, and also, with those systems which perpetuate sexual assault and those people um, involved in these systems, uh, recognizing that not only is this a 
problem that we have to address. Um, but really, like, let's not just talk about alcohol policy, but let's also teach people not to be perpetrators or perpetrators of these attacks. Um, so the answer is really both. It's, it's everyone. Um, the culture is created at Northwestern by everyone involved in the Wildcat community. And we all have to step forward to actually recognize that there is an issue. Um, and then we can take steps to moving forward. Okay, well, one of your most ambitious goals of your plan to combat sexual assault at Northwestern is to change the university from a dry campus to a wet campus. First, just so that everybody knows, what is the difference between a dry campus and a wet campus? What do those terms mean? And then, what do you hope that does to combat sexual assault? And then, how do you plan to imp implement them? Yeah, so Northwestern is currently a dry campus, and that means that there is no alcohol to be, a, to be consumed on campus. and by having that policy, it kind of allows the administration to ignore that students are drinking on campus. And for, by pushing for a wet campus policy, it allows for students to drink in safer places than frat houses because we all know that Greek life has a monopoly on alcohol on campus. And it allows for proactive measures to ensure that students are responsibly consuming alcohol. So to be clear, students would still have to be 21 and older to drink alcohol? Well, on this campus, you can consume alcohol if you are 21 and older um, because there's no legal way for um, this administration to prohibit you from consuming alcohol if you are of age and legally uh, able to under the federal law, right? Um, but what it really means is uh, there is a little bit more liability on um, the university and the administration when instead of saying we want to promote a like a wellness culture with students who do consume alcohol and are um, perhaps unintentionally sick because of it, um, we're taking a step back and recognizing that students who are underage do consume alcohol. Um, and so instead, let's, let's make that a safer process for them, um, even though they're not of age. So that's where, where the difference really comes in. So how does that process work then, transferring to a, a wet campus? Is that something that's going to be fast, something that's going to be, be easy? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, fast and easy is exactly how Excellent. it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's going <laughs> to okay. No, um, I mean, no, we've looked at a number. Of, so, so one of the things that um, um, you might know is we are part of the Kofi Consortium, right? So we are one of a number of institutions that are part of Kofi. And what that means is that we can really look at our peer institutions and look at how we compare to them. And a number of our peer institutions, for example, Washington University in St. Louis um, or Stanford University, employ similar policies to um, the sort of policies that we espoused on our, um, on our platform. And so the transition from what we look at right now to something more similar to what Wash U or Vanderbilt or Stanford have um, is going to be a slow transition just because it requires a number of administrators to get on board. Um, but our hope is that we can set at least the groundwork for those that transition to be made in the coming years. Okay. So one of your three plans in your campaign platform is inclusivity and accessibility, which, which on your website starts with, quote, building a more open and accessible ASG. Last year, current president and vice president Salen uh, Christina Salento and Max Vinson also centered their campaign on like a similar kind of a, a foundation. So where did they fall short? And what are you planning to do differently to, ho to help more marginalized students uh, become uh, have have better access to ASG. So, I think that the individuals in office in ASG um, have so little to do with the ability of the student student body to access their student government. And the honest truth is the reason for that is we inherited a very decentralized and bureaucratic system. Um, and so where they felt short was uh, effectively not being superhuman. Um, and we yeah. won't be superhuman either, even though we both strive to be. Um, but what we are going to do, one of our biggest plans is honestly an internal audit of ASG. It's not something that's like hugely promoted because it's not like it's not sexy and honestly no one probably cares but as soon as something like this happens and takes place and we can restructure ASG so that there's so much less that falls on the individual and so much more that falls to the structure then I think that it will become naturally a more in inclusive and accessible environment for students to reach out to um, and so that's really just something that we've inherited for not just you know Christina's presidency or our coming presidency or even before that Noah's but actually so many 
so many generations prior to that. Uh, it's something that I talked about with Noah even our fresh my my freshman year, back when he was still Speaker of the Senate. <laughs> Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> Nahar Kamala Cutler and Rosalie Gamber, thank you guys so much for joining us. Good luck in, in your tenure. When we come back, we'll have a Politi chat with former Obama speechwriter Cody Keenan, and we'll talk with our Politicat panel. Stay with us. At Northwestern, we're Wildcats in every way. and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline. At Northwestern University, the possibilities are endless. Northwestern alum and director of speech writing for former President Obama sat down with Politicat's Tyler, Tyler Kendall to discuss politics. Let's take a look. Crazy long shot, and you know, as as smart and eloquent and experienced as President Obama was, you know, the country's still asking, "Are we ready for a black president?" And uh, but the, the campaign was full of these passionate, idealistic young people who just work their tails off all over the country. The West Wing is kind of the heartbeat of the whole enterprise and it's up to anyone who works in there to make sure everybody across the government and really every citizen knows why we're doing what we're doing. And it would involve, you know, it's kind of a technological black hole, at least when we showed up. We gradually made it a little bit better. Um, but it would really involve just phone calls and email and old-fashioned footwork and pulling people in for meetings and face-to-face -face stuff. I don't know what's next and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, if there's a, obviously not, a big fan of President Trump's, but if there's a silver lining in his victory, it's that people are getting informed and active and engaged. And I've been stunned by the amount of people I know alone who've decided to run for office or start up cool organizations or, you know, podcasts or young people on campuses to get involved and engage in a way they haven't in a long time. It sounds really strange, but I'm actually rooting for them to get their stuff together. Uh, and I sympathize because it's difficult when you first get in there, especially if you haven't worked in there before. And they had a strong disdain for anyone that reeked of Washington elitism or government, but you really need some people like that in there to show you what you're doing. And I think we made some of the same mistakes in the beginning too, thinking we're gonna shake things up, we're gonna do it totally differently. You come to realize pretty quickly you need people that know what they're doing. Uh, and they'll get there, you know, I'm not necessarily gonna cheerlead the policies that they're pursuing, but I do root for them to know what they're doing and figure it out and do a good job because a lot of things are at stake. The full interview will be available tonight on our Facebook page here. Now, in international news, the world was shocked to discover last Tuesday that Syrian Air Force, that the Syrian Air Force, under the direction of Bashar al-Assad, dropped the nerve agent, sarin, in gas form on its own citizens. The gas, which is banned by international law, claimed the lives of at least 74 people and injured hundreds more in the rebel-held town of Khan Shikun. President Trump denounced the attack, along with his Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and the ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, who accused the Russian government of knowing about the attack beforehand. On Friday, in retaliation, the United States launched 59 cruise missiles from the airfield at the airfield from which the gas attack originated. At least seven Syrian soldiers were killed in the attack, which the Syrian government called, quote, an act of aggression. To discuss further, we'd like to welcome NU College Democrats President Alex Newman 
and NU College Republicans head of PR, Sammy Quaddle. Sammy, Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. So to start, let's talk. How has the Trump administration changed its approach to Syria in the past week, and what does this mean going forward? Sammy? So Trump campaigned on a very non-interventionist platform. Uh, it's one of the biggest reasons why a lot of his supporters voted for him, thinking that this was going to be the end of what's been almost two decades of interminable war. Uh, so this is a huge shift in direction from the Trump administration. You know, Rex Tillerson coming out saying that Bashar al-Assad has no business governing Syria, advocating for almost regime change, which is the complete opposite of what he was doing before. Uh, so in the future, I think this is the direction he's going to stick to. It seems like uh, he has the backing of the majority of the Republican Party on this move, and going forward, I believe he'll, he'll keep it. As a Democrat, does this direction make you feel nervous? Or? Definitely. I think anything that this administration does makes you feel nervous. Um, I don't think it comes to surprises that, to any of us nowadays um, that he's gone for this change. I think we've seen changes pretty much every day in, in this White House. Um, yeah, he may have come up with a different platform to begin with, but I think as we've seen, um, they've kind of gone back and forth with every area of policy. Um, and so I really don't know what to expect day by day, and I'm worried that he might take more rash action to endanger U.S. citizens and people abroad. Okay. Well, the chemical attack against Syrian civilians not only brought media attention to the full horrors happening in the country, but also the attention of governments worldwide. So why do you think it's taken so long for the world to finally recognize all the horrors and atrocities in Syria? Well, I think it's not so much a matter of recognizing the horrors of Syria. It's more thinking about what to do. Uh, I think the major governments in the world are well aware of what's happening in Syria, but it's a very complicated situation there. Uh, you have loads of competing interests. You have two of the largest superpowers in the world heavily involved there. Uh, it's not really something that someone can just jump in there and do whatever they want, uh, which is why I think that uh, Trump and his advisors took the necessary steps to come to this conclusion. And I think that they, I, I'm confident that they'll do so moving forward also. Alex? I'm not really confident that Trump and his administration really have the, the best ideas um, for these people uh, going forward. I think that we saw early in his, in his presidency and during his campaign that he was very critical um, and, and mean towards a lot of the people that were living in Syria, and he you know, tried to pass so much l legislation, even issued some orders, um, really trying to ban immigrants from that country. And so it's pretty unclear really who he's speaking on behalf of and if he's really advocating for their best needs. Um, he claims that this, that this strike was in support of people on the ground, but at the same time he's not letting those refugees come to our country. Um, so I'm really unconfident that he has their best interests at heart. Sammy, you want to respond? Yeah, I think that uh, the situation with uh, Syrian civilians and the situation that you know these airstrikes deal with is completely different. Uh, I think that these were both done in terms of, uh, I guess, addressing national security concerns and national interests abroad. I think that uh, the Trump administration has shown uh, some degree of flexibility in terms of uh, the refugee situation. He is, you know, announcing like uh, the extreme vetting measures earlier. Uh, and now with this switch, I think that he's definitely making the steps towards, I guess, almost falling in line with the mainstream opinion on what should be done in Syria. Very quickly, you have anything you'd like to say? I don't really agree that it's really organized at all. I think that we've seen just last week he really kicked someone off of his Security Council, um, and there's so many changes going, going on in, in his administration, so I don't really see any consistent plan going forward, um, and I have no faith in his ability to, to govern his commander-in-chief. Okay. Well, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson today criticized Russian President Vladimir Putin's inability to destroy the Syrian chemical weapons. Tillerson had pre has previously received a friendship award from the Russian government. Now, as part of the Trump cabinet, the, uh, Tillerson has taken a strong hand against Russia. Uh, Alex, I'll start with you. Uh, do you think he'll be the one to be able to get through to Vladimir Putin, given his history? I really doubt anyone from Trump's administration or cabinet or even inner circle will, will be able to get through to Russia. Um, I think that Trump has been very critical of Russia, um, and, you know, very just rude towards them. Um, and actually, his, his Tillerson is, is the first um, to not have a meeting with Putin um, on his first trip to Moscow. And so I think rather than seeing an open line of communication, we're seeing more kind of insults and tension between them. And I really think that this could be um, a period of worsening of our um, Russian relationship. Um, even, even though Tillerson received the Friendship Medal? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, Sammy, what do you think? I, I support the position the Trump administration is taking against Russia. Uh, it's important for the U.S. to remain the hegemonic power in the world. Uh, Russia is clearly against our interests and in against our values, and I think that 
reinforcing the fact that we're not going to stay, stay on the sidelines is important. Are you worried that there's too close of a relationship with Russia and that he's received that medal? Uh, not really. I think this strike alone shows that the administration was very capable of separating those two things. Okay. Well, we are going to take a very quick break. And when we get back, changes to our democracy, what does it mean? This is Politicat. At Northwestern University, we are pioneering innovation and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline. University, the possibilities are endless. Judge Neil M. Gorsuch was sworn in yesterday as the 113th Supreme Court Justice, filling a 14-month vacancy on the court left by the death of Justice Antonin Scalia. Gorsuch's confirmation was not without conflict. When Senate Democrats filibustered the vote, Republicans voted to lower the threshold of votes required to break the filibuster from 60 to a simple majority. In deploying this so-called nuclear option, Republicans have fundamentally changed the way the Senate will carry out one of its most important duties. This move, once unthinkable, is a testament to the growing partisan tension on Capitol Hill after decades of bipartisan cooperation on Supreme Court hearings. So, going forward. The Senate will no longer be able to filibuster the Supreme Court nominations or other appointments to lower courts. What does that mean for the future of the Supreme Court battles? Let's, let's start with you, Sammy. I think, to no one's surprise, this is a huge sign that all of these conflicts are going to be more partisan. Uh, I think that if there are any more vacancies in the Supreme Court during Trump's first term, I think the fight's going to be even worse than the one we saw with Gorsuch. Uh, at least this was you know, conservative replacing conservative. If one of the more traditional liberal judges either resigns or uh, has to vacate their seat, the Democrats are going to definitely fight tooth and nail to make sure that it's, that seat's replaced by a, a liberal judge in the same mold. And the Republicans are also going to try their hardest to fight that. Uh, so I think uh, it's not looking good in terms of getting smooth nominations through. Do you think that invoking the nuclear option was a good idea? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that Gorsuch was a great nominee to the Supreme Court. I think the Republicans were left with little choice. Uh, I think it had to be done. Alex? I bet you feel differently. <laughs> a little bit. I won't say that I support the decision. I will say that I'm not surprised. Um, I think the GOP already did the unthinkable um, last year when they refused to even hear Obama's Supreme Court nominee. That had pretty much never been done before. Um, and now you see Democrats doing something pretty typical, a filibuster, and then again the GOP responds by doing something that is altogether unprecedented. And so I think that while I don't support it, um, it, it was expected. So are you worried about then the, the future Supreme Court battles then now that they've invoked the nuclear option? I think given current trend, things only get more polarized. Um, and since it's now easier for them to confirm nominees, um, I think if, uh, if there's more turnover on the court um, during Trump's administration, we might see more um, Trump appointed justices get to the court, and that definitely worries me quite a bit. So if the Senate can remove the right for the, of the minority party to filibuster court appointments, many senators are worried they will also lose the ability to filibuster legislation as well. Alex, what does this mean for the Senate as they consider some controversial legislation that will be on the table in the future? Well, I think given kind of the current trend of politics we've been seeing, um, there's a lot of kind of brash and bold moves being, being made, and that means that we could see some possible legislation um, on the table that might be really harmful to a lot of people in this country, um, since there's really not as much ability for us to now slow down this process and for Democrats to maybe take a step back and try to ease things over, that can mean that some pretty harmful bills could get passed uh, in the future. So, Sammy, I mean, does this worry you? I, on the one hand, yes, the Republicans will be able to get more legislation through, but is this, is this undermining, you know, democracy? I don't think it undermines democracy the way we make it seem. Uh, okay. I think, you know, for starters, the Supreme Court is uh, one place that was supposed to be meant to not be affected too much by the wills of the people. Uh, but in terms of legislation, I think that that's not really something to worry about. Uh, passing legislation takes a lot more uh, like coalition building and teamwork than getting a Supreme Court justice to the, to the court, I think. Okay. So let's talk about something we actually touched on a minute ago. Justices uh, Anthony M. Kennedy, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Stephen G. Breyer are all around 80 years old. That means Trump could potentially appoint three more Supreme Court justices in his presidency. 
Uh, I know we've talked about this a little bit with Sammy. I'll start with you. Do you think the next Supreme Court appointment will be equally as contested as this one, even, it, even if it occurs midway through Trump's presidency? Uh, no, I think it'll be a lot more. And not only that, but the, with the midterms coming up, I think that uh, the House and the Senate will change, definitely the makeup of them. So I think we could see more of a tense fight. Okay. What do you think that'll do then to the midterms if that fight starts to break out, let's say, before the midterms? Well, I think, uh, I, I don't think the Republicans are in the best position for the midterm elections. You know, their legislative record the first 100 days has been kind of weak, and their constituents are angry. So I think that uh, getting Gorsuch nominated to the Supreme Court was somewhat of a victory for the GOP, and I think they're going to have to look into that moving forward also. Alex? Yeah, I think the fact that this one victory was pretty much their only victory over the first 100 days um, says something. Usually over the first 100 days we've witnessed, it's pretty easy for presidents to pass uh, quite a lot of things, um, and Trump has failed to do that um, all pretty much altogether. And so I think that um, if that's their only victory, it's not looking good for them come midterm season, and hopefully we'll see some change in the makeup of uh, uh, the House and Senate, and that can maybe make it harder for Trump to appoint justices uh, in the next few years. All right, well, I think we'll have to wait until then. Alex, Sammy, thank you guys so much uh, for being here and for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And now that's going to bring us to the final word. The views expressed in this segment are not necessarily the views of Northwestern University nor NNN. They are the views of the Politicat editorial staff. Back in January, we got a glimpse of President Trump's 2018 budget plans, which include defunding the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which funds local PBS and NPR stations, as well as outright eliminating the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts. These cuts were alarming to many. The NEA provides funding for arts programs, especially in low-income areas like the one where I grew up. Then last month, Trump unveiled his full preliminary 2018 budget proposal which calls for much deeper cuts to much larger programs. The Environmental Protection Agency is getting its discretionary spending slashed by 31 percent, the State Department by 29 percent, the Agriculture and Labor Departments lose 21 percent apiece, and the list goes on. All of this comes alongside increases to the Departments of Veterans Affairs, Homeland Security, and Defense, the last of which would jump from $587 billion this year to $639 billion in 2018. And yeah, that's billion with a B. It's important to have a strong and well-funded military, and the United States has the greatest military in the world. But there's a concept in international relations called soft power, which is the influence a country has on the world based on its culture and values. What does it say to other countries when we eliminate arts programs? What does it say to other countries when we cut discretionary spending on protecting the environment by nearly a third? And perhaps more importantly, what does it say to other countries when we start beefing up our military by $52 billion? The world is changing, and that can be scary, but let's not abandon diplomacy. After all, it, it won us the Cold War. These proposed cuts are sending a message to the world that enriching the lives of American citizens and negotiating deals peacefully through diplomacy take a back seat to physical military power and brute force. Will other nations automatically assume a military option is on the table whenever they go to negotiations with the United States? What does this do to our di diplomatic power moving forward? Kindness, compassion, and cooperation can go a long way. And that is something I learned on Sesame Street. That's going to do it for our show tonight. I would like to thank our guests once again, uh, Alex Newman and Sammy Quaddle. Uh, we will be back again next Tuesday. I'd also like to give a big thanks to Nahar Kamal Cutler and Rosalie Gambra, and a super special thanks to Cody Keenan for sitting down with us for our Polita Chat. I'm Andrew America. Thanks for watching.